Welcome to Afternoon Briefing this Thursday. Greg Jennett with you in Canberra here on Ngunnawal Country. And welcome back to Fran Kelly with us as always on Gadigal Land in our Sydney studios. And Fran, we will be into our regular review of the day with you and get your analysis in just a moment. But first, we do want to bring you a few more details on a most unexpected campaign incident today, this being the vehicle rollover in Tasmania involving a car in the Prime Minister's police escort convoy. Now, our reporter on the campaign bus following Scott Morrison's campaign is Stephanie Boris. She gave us an update as she was about to board a plane in Burnie. Stephanie, Boris, these campaigns are constantly moving exercises. Uh, you're really moving as a group, but the Prime Minister, I think, slightly ahead of you. Exactly what do you understand happened this afternoon with that group of vehicles? Good afternoon, Greg. Well, today we've been travelling around northern Tasmania following the Prime Minister to different events. He, of course, is campaigning ahead of that May 21 election. This afternoon, uh, the media bus traditionally follows behind the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his security detail. Not right behind, but, you know, 15 minutes behind them. We passed an accident on the media bus and what we saw was a number of emergency vehicles flashing lights. Down the side of the road, there was a car that was rolled on its side. A number of the windows were smashed and we could see three people on stretchers. Now, because we were on the bus, we kept moving, albeit slowly, and then about an hour after passing that accident, we actually received confirmation that the vehicle that we saw, in fact, was one of the Prime Minister's security detail cars. So, Stephanie Boris, you're at Burnie Airport. I assume the Prime Minister is in Burnie as well. What has he had to say about the accident? So the Prime Minister has issued a statement following the accident confirming that, yes, the car involved was his security members. They were in the car following the Prime Minister. Four people were injured in that accident. Two of them are Tasmanian police officers and two of them are AFP officers. I'll, I'll read you out the statement now, Greg, that we've received. It says the Prime Minister is not injured and was not involved in the accident. Uh, those four police officers who were in the Prime Minister's security detail in what's known as the follow vehicle have been taken to hospital from the scene for further assessment. All officers were conscious when transferred. The driver of the other vehicle was not injured. Scott Morrison goes on to say family members of the officers have been contacted and are being kept informed of their condition. The Prime Minister is always extremely grateful for the protection provided by his security team and extends his best wishes for their recovery and to their families. Now, Greg, as a result of this accident this afternoon, the Prime Minister has cancelled all of the other events he had planned for campaigning today. Yep, Steffi, I know that still means you've got to make a move, so we'll let you go for that plane. Thanks so much for the update. Well, as you'd expect, that accident has slightly altered Scott Morrison's schedule for the afternoon. In fact, as Steffi was just explaining. But, Fran, to my eyes, it already looked like both Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese were beginning to slow down anyway ahead of the Easter long weekend. Yeah, that's right, Greg. What it meant was that they'd been running a little harder a little earlier throughout this day. The Prime Minister in Tasmania, the Labor leader in the Coleridge-Hunter region of New South Wales. Here's how day four shaped up. I'll talk about what my priorities are. Jobs, 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 jobs and jobs. <laughs> Another announcement from a government that's all announcement and no delivery. Wood is good. <laughs> Yesterday, when he walked away from a National Anti-Corruption Commission. Some people disagree with me. Some people agree with me. Some people don't like how I say some things. Other people do. But you know who I am. People don't know who you are or what you stand for. Who is this guy? That's what Australians are asking. I'm putting forward my plan for a better future for Australia. This is election is a choice between who you do know and what they have done and what our plans are and someone you just don't know. I am who I am. 
I, I will be getting about uh, being me, uh, putting forward my propositions. So I think what people are interested in is who has a plan for Australia's future. I have a plan for the future. Yeah, so rival plans and character, it's all got a familiar ring to it. We're not exactly or technically at week's end, although it does feel like it. So it was perhaps fitting, really, Fran, that the week ended with the same focus on official monthly unemployment figures which had stumped Anthony Albanese in that damaging start to the week way back on Monday when talking about a jobless rate at 4% and a much vaunted economic plan. That all seemed to suit the government again today, I thought, Fran. Well, it certainly did, Greg. Let's face it, a 4% unemployment rate, as you mentioned, was the tripwire for Anthony Albanese at the start of this week. I'm sure that 4% number is an unwelcome reminder for all in the Labor opposition camp at the moment. But it's a strong result, the lowest unemployment rate matching the lowest unemployment rate since the 70s. To be honest, though, Greg, everyone was prepped for something a bit better, something starting with the three in front of it was what we were expecting. The Treasurer did his best to get there. Yeah, why don't we actually just uh, hear from Josh Frydenberg. He uh, makes the point in Melbourne today that he, I think we, we all know they were hoping it would dip below 4%. Technically, it almost did, but not quite. Here was Josh Frydenberg. Technically, the number is 3.95, uh, but obviously it's rounded up to, to 4%. But to be the equal lowest in 48 years is something which is... Uh, a real success for 26 million Australians. This result belongs to them. Yeah, that close, but uh, no banana Missed it on it by the, that much. Yeah, exactly. On the 3%. We'll see what next month brings, maybe, Fran. But Labor's obviously not going to quibble with a low unemployment figure, no matter what the number, Fran. So that led Scott Morrison to pounce on what he claims, familiar territory for him, is Anthony Albanese's inconsistent record on border security. Any validity to that? We'll discuss that in a moment. Here's how the Prime Minister presented it. We'll turn boats back. Turning boats back means that you don't need offshore detention. Anthony Albanese has had every position on border protection. He has supported everything he has opposed and he's opposed everything that he has supported. Um, and we've seen that across so many issues. So I, I'm, I'm not surprised that Australians are confused about what he stands for. So what do you mean when you say turning back boats means you don't need offshore detention? No, well, well, that's the preference at the moment. There aren't people have gone into offshore detention in recent times because the boats have been turned back. It's been effective. But you would and keep those centres? Just Australia clarifying, you would, yes. you would keep the yes. centres? Oh, it's classic wedge, Greg. This is, as you say, old stomping ground for the coalition in election campaigns in particular and for Scott Morrison. The reality is there aren't any boats getting through. The turnback policy is working. Labor supported it for some years now. Uh, Greg, these camps at the moment are unnecessary. There's virtually nobody left in them. The US has accepted 1,200 people. New Zealand's now taking 150 a year. They're very expensive to run. Australia currently pays, even with few people in them, about $40 million a month to run offshore processing on Nauru and the cost of holding a single refugee on Nauru is $4.3 million a year for one refugee. And there are real questions too about who's making money from running these camps. Senate Estimates has revealed that there's one small company that's been awarded n a number of multi-million dollar contracts without going out to tender with very little transparency around the terms. So offshore processing right now is a very, very expensive deterrent. Little more. Yeah, now speaking of such things, expensive exercises, that is, Fran. The government's under pressure again this afternoon over something that was much discussed this week, a half a million dollar, reportedly, payout to a former Alan Tudge staffer, Rochelle Miller. What's the latest on this? Well, yes, Rochelle Miller has come out through her lawyers with a public statement this afternoon, Greg. Uh, well, let me read you some parts of it. It said that um, given that the details of that payout um, over employment issues for to Ms Miller has been released at around a half a million dollars, she's saying there was confidentially around that. None of our camp has released it. Therefore, the leak must have come from the government. And uh, she says that has caused her embarrassment. So, Ms Miller, this afternoon, um, this all comes in the context 
context of earlier this week, the Prime Minister reaffirming that Scott, that Alan Tudge will, will be, uh, remains Education Minister and will be back in Scott Morrison's Cabinet as Education Minister after yeah. the election. That raised the obvious question on the campaign trail. How can Mr Tudge be fit for Cabinet if Ms Miller is receiving a half a million dollar payout. The Prime Minister said it's a matter between Ms Miller and the Department of Finance. Well now Ms Miller says she's happy to release the government of any confidentiality around these details. In fact she said, Greg, and let me read this through her statement from the lawyers, especially given the very public context of this dispute and the misleading statements which have been made that Mr Tudge has been cleared of all wrongdoing, Ms Miller wishes to remove any impediment which prevents the Prime Minister from giving a full and truthful account of matters he now feels constrained to avoid answering on account of any legal obligation to Ms Miller. In other words, it's over to the PM. Yeah, right, they've thrown down the gauntlet. So uh, this was actually a matter, Fran, that the Finance Minister and Liberal campaign spokesman Simon Birmingham, Birmingham has had to address uh, periodically throughout the week. We spoke to him just before we went to air today. Not only on that, you'll have to wait some way into the discussion to hear his response, but also about the unemployment rate today and where it's settled at 4%. Here was our discussion with Simon Birmingham. Simon Birmingham, welcome back to Afternoon Briefing. What's the latest you've got on the vehicle accident involving members of the police who were following the Prime Minister's vehicle? We've seen some pretty disturbing images of a crumpled car. Thanks, Greg. Uh, look, it's a sad part of public life that uh, the senior figures uh, need to have police protection and the members of the Australian Federal Police, the Tasmanian Police and indeed those right around the country uh, put their lives on the line to protect others. Uh, uh, in this case, it appears to have been uh, a vehicle accident. Uh, I understand that there are no serious injuries, injuries as a result of that, so that's a great relief to, uh, to everybody. I know that the Prime Minister cares very much about those in the police detail who work with him, as I know others who have similar protection arrangements do in relation to their team. So we would all be very relieved, and the PM particularly relieved, to know that their families have been reassured that, uh, that they are uh, OK. Uh, and, of course, we wish them all the speediest of recoveries. OK, and the status of the Prime Minister's campaign, is that suspended, paused in any way because of this development? I believe there was an afternoon event that, uh, that has been cancelled as, uh, as a result and, uh, and that would be both a combination of concern and logistics, I'm sure, just in terms of the disruption there. But uh, these things happen, accidents can happen uh, and, of course, we just have uh, uh, the best wishes of the individuals involved at heart when it comes to ensuring their speed of recovery and uh, everyone will get, no doubt, back on the campaign trail as is appropriate over and beyond the Easter weekend. Yeah, of course. Let's take you to the economy and is the labour market in trouble with the unemployment rate. Sure, it's static at 4%, but there's some real pinch points there in particular states. The female rate is already uh, having a three in front of it. Uh, where are we going to find the workers necessary as we see shortages acute in some sectors like transport? Well, Greg, if you're going to have problems in, a, in an economy, it's far better to have the problems of having a very strong labour market with very strong job opportunities uh, than it is to have the reverse. And it's not that long ago when we went into the depths of COVID-19 that the forecasts were for very high rates of unemployment. And we know from previous recessions, such as the recession that Paul Keating had uh, when the Labor Party was in office, that there was a very long tail uh, of unemployment and particularly of youth unemployment. What our plans and policies have managed to deliver uh, is to get unemployment down to near 50-year lows at 4%. Uh, to see in these figures uh, that women's unemployment is even lower, youth unemployment is even lower, underemployment has come down as well. Uh, all of that shows that the policies are working. Uh, the 1.7 million jobs we've managed to uh, generate across the economy while we've been in office. And yes, uh, our plans are to see 1.3 million more generated 
over the course of the next five years if we're re-elected. And we achieve that by investing in the skilling of the nation, ensuring that through our partnership with the states, the billions of dollars uh, as part of that partnership, we're able to give that sort of support to the states and territories to skill and to train people to fill the roles that are necessary in the future. Would Our you be prepared to revisit the immigration? Generated... Sorry to interrupt, but would, would you be prepared to uh, revisit the immigration cap if necessary, if things tighten uh, much further than they already are? What we've managed to do at present, Greg, is to is to target uh, our migration arrangements in the most effective way possible as we reopen borders. Firstly, to provide the incentives to get working holiday makers, backpackers, international students back to Australia sooner, knowing the contribution they make in many parts of our economy, particularly the lesser skilled roles across the economy. Also, within the permanent migration cap, to increase the number of places for skilled migrants, uh, recognising that we'd brought forward uh, the filling of a number of partner visa categories and therefore have the headroom and the ability uh, to create more places for skilled migration. And that uh, itself delivers a further dividend into the economy uh, by having migrants coming into Australia who all of the economic analysis shows uh, provide a dividend of more likely to work, more likely to pay more taxes, more likely to create other jobs across the economy. So uh, this is all about an economic plan that's intertwined, is working to date, and with that skills investment coupled with our infrastructure investment, investment in new technologies, it all comes together to make sure that we continue to drive those advances and get a 4% unemployment rate headed down to a number with a three in front of it. All right, let's see where that goes. I want to take you to another campaign issue of the day, which is Integrity Commission. You know the Senate better than most. The Prime Minister's essentially saying we won't go back there because we can't win the argument unless Labor joins us. If an election is a contest of ideas, why is the government so frightened of its own shadow here? Why not put up a proposal, fight for it and put it into the Parliament? after this election if you win? Well, Greg, we have a proposal. Indeed, we have more of a proposal than the Labor Party. We have uh, a legislation for an integrity commission that's been subject to extensive consultation. While we've been doing that, we've put extra funding uh, into some of the anti-corruption and law enforcement agencies across government, like the Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. And if we win this election, if we win this election, uh, then there will have been um, a strong demonstration that despite all the campaigns waged uh, by the Labor Party or others seemingly wanting some type of New South Wales type star chamber, our model, which we believe is the more sensible approach to ensure uh, that corruption within government is tackled, uh, without undermining confidence in public systems, but in fact underpinning it by having a safe and effective model in place, uh, then I would hope the Labor Party reconsiders their position and perhaps supports our model right. and provides for its passage through the Parliament. Well, that's the mandate argument, but why not make a commitment here and now that you will, in fact, present that? I won't say represent, because I don't think it's even been presented to Parliament so far, but present that to the next Parliament. We will assess the situation in the next parliament, but our policy is clear. Uh, we've committed to it. We've done the hard yards of developing the legislative model. There's the couple of hundred, few hundred pages of legislation there to demonstrate that we have a model that's been out for public consultation, that's had the draft shared with the nation. All the Labor Party have got is a few pages uh, of theory or concept uh, around it. Uh, but of course, in that theory or concept are some of the danger points in terms of if you misdesign this type of model, it potentially just becomes a vehicle for wrecking reputations rather than upholding integrity and addressing corruption. Yeah. We think the last two points are important, to uphold integrity, to address corruption, but to do it in ways that don't go out and destroy reputations along the way. That's why we've carefully designed a model uh, and we would very much welcome the Labor Party indicating their support for our model if we're successful at this election. And uh, it's a choice across the board. It's a strong choice on issues like that. But it's a choice, of course, fundamentally on jobs, the economy, opportunities for Australians, or as we saw today, uh, in terms of border protection. 
it's a choice there as well, with Anthony Albanese demonstrating yeah. that he's all at sea when it comes to border protection policies, uh, just as he is when it comes to economic policies or national security All right. Policies. Well, time is going to limit a discussion on boats and border security uh, today, Simon Birmingham. But one final matter. I know you've done a lot of interviews this week that have referenced the Rochelle Miller Allen Tudge uh, legal settlement, or in fact, Department of Finance legal settlement in that case. Her lawyers have written and they've published this afternoon uh, that they are irrevocably releasing the Commonwealth from any obligation of confidentiality around this. Uh, in view of that letter, are you now prepared to fully disclose where we're at and how much will be paid in this settlement? Well, Greg, I'm aware of, uh, of a tweet and, uh, and a tweet containing a letter that's gone out this afternoon, uh, apparently from Ms Miller's lawyers. Uh, I haven't had the chance to uh, either consider or be briefed on the content of that letter. Uh, as I've explained in other interviews which you referenced, uh, I have not and government ministers or politicians are not uh, party to negotiations of settlements between former staff and, uh, and government departments. They are handled at arm's length from politicians, as they should be. Yeah, but uh, if confidentiality was revoked... Processes. Yeah, but if confidentiality was revoked, that would, that would change those arrangements and, and at least theoretically put you in a position where you could disclose? Well, Greg, I don't have any information to disclose because I've not been party to the deliberations or negotiations. Now, uh, I'm sure that uh, that correspondence will be considered uh, by officials, uh, as it should be, given that they are the ones who've undertaken uh, those negotiations. All right. Well, uh, we'll leave it there and no doubt be t speaking to you again before too long, probably week two. Enjoy the Easter break. Simon Birmingham. Thank you, Greg. All the best to you and to all of your viewers. So on the matter of unemployment, whether the jobless rate has a three or a four in front of it, it still leads to the same question. When will employers have to pay more to secure the labour that they need? That's especially relevant if you're trying to catch a plane somewhere at the moment in Australia. We discuss the highly unusual state of the jobs market with Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Chief Andrew McKellar and also ACTU President Michelle O'Neill. Both joined us a short time ago. Andrew McKellar, yeah. Michelle O'Neill, welcome back both of you to Afternoon Briefing. Uh, Michelle, uh, very positive news on the jobs front. Didn't quite creep below 4% unemployment uh, in the latest data, but it is in several jurisdictions and it is for women. So with each passing month, Michelle, do you feel we are getting closer and closer to that tipping point where real wage increases will start to kick in? Well, unfortunately, Greg, the old economic theory, which was really one that came out of the 80s, is no longer true in terms of what's happening between the connection of unemployment figures being low and wages going up. And we know this now because it's been proven um, time and time again that uh, we had the government say we're going to get to wage increases when unemployment gets to 5%. Then we said we're going to get to wage increases when unemployment gets to 4%. And, of course, what we've seen is the opposite to be true. We've seen nine years of stagnant wages and then in, as unemployment started to fall last year, so did wages even more so. So mm. we've now got real wages going backwards. So why don't we take it over to you then, Andrew McKellar. Where is the tipping point? I know uh, industry is going to talk about skills, skills, skills. Give us more mm. workers, give us more skills. Why not wages, wages, wages? Well, look, I, I think it's a, it's a bit of both, uh, to be honest. So uh, you're absolutely right. At the moment, uh, we are facing uh, one of the most uh, chronic uh, labour and skills shortages that the Australian economy has faced in nearly uh, 50 years. Uh, right across uh, many, many sectors, uh, industry is uh, screaming out for more workers, uh, wanting more skilled workers. And we're seeing that reflected in the employment numbers uh, today. You know, an unemployment rate, 4%. Uh, uh, we're at or near uh, full employment. Uh, this is the lowest level the employment rate has been, the equal lowest level it's been uh, since 1974. Uh, and we do expect uh, that that rate will uh, drop under 4% uh, in the months ahead. Right, so uh, when does it convert over in the workers' favour sure. into wages? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the things we've got to understand at the moment is that there is an enormous choice. Uh, so it's almost a situation where employees 
are interviewing employers uh, as to whether they want to work uh, at that particular location. Uh, supply and demand uh, is still alive and well, uh, uh, and I do expect that we will see uh, wages uh, pushing up uh, in the months ahead. Uh, I think that's inevitable. What we've had over a long period now is a low inflation environment. We are seeing that changing uh, and we'll see wages uh, push up with that. If we're going to get sustained increases in real wages, there's only one thing that can deliver that outcome and that's productivity growth. Now, productivity growth has been very weak uh, over a long period of time. Uh, we have to have a real action plan, a reform plan to restart uh, productivity growth. Uh, if we're going to do that, then uh, then we will start to see real wages. Okay. And I know, Andrew, you've been pushing IR mm. reform and, and other mm. cuts quite throughout right. the week. But, mm. Michelle, during the depths of the pandemic, quite obviously the ACTU and employer groups were prepared and did uh, sit down around the table and, you know, look at what was necessary at that time. If we are meeting a really severe crunch here on worker shortages, what are the common grounds on which we could see, you know, a round two of those discussions between the likes of you and Andrew McKellar? Well, the first thing I'd say is that I, I think some of what Andrew's describing is a bit of a fantasy. Um, it's not the case that uh, we've seen productivity shared. So, in fact, productivity has gone up six times more than wages in the last six years. So, the automatic flow on, if you like, that we're going to see productivity improvements and therefore wages are going to go up has just yet again been proven not to be true. You have to have changes in the system to ensure that productivity is fairly shared and we don't have that at the moment. So uh, the idea that this is just somehow something that's going to happen organically is completely not borne out by what's happened over the last decade um, in terms of when the economy has been going well, yeah. there's been no wage increases. But, but if when you the were to force the going issue... badly, there's been no wage increases. So there's something broken in this story. No, fair enough. And if you were to try to fix that or, or to force the issue through some, you know, single hit or, or set of reforms, what can you put your finger on, Michelle? Well, I think, I think there's immediate things that the Morrison government could be doing that they've failed to do. So, for example, there is the minimum wage case and the minimum wage case is on at the moment. We put in a claim for a 5% lift in the minimum wage and that's going to affect one in four workers, that uh, minimum wage decision. If the government was serious about supporting wage increases and, in fact, if Aki was serious about this being good for the economy as well, they'd be in that case arguing for the need to lift significantly the minimum wages of workers in this right. country. But they're yeah. failing to do so. And so the Morrison government goes in there and says, don't worry, you know, we're projecting wage growth. Well, they projected wage growth 52 out of 55 times since they've been in power and they, uh, they've been wrong. 52 yep. out of 55 times they've been wrong. So workers aren't going to believe the myth. Uh, we've got to see the answer to this and one of the answers is supporting minimum wage. The other, of course, is aged care as an example. This is not just what unions think, even the employers in the aged care sector and, of course, the Royal Commission mm -hmm. told us that one of the key things in that sector was lifting wages. Quality jobs will result in quality care. But, again, Morrison government failed to intervene and support that. Sure. And the third thing I'd say, Greg, is that they're one of the largest employers in the country. Uh, and as one of the largest employers, why don't they lead by example in terms of support for pay increases for public sector workers? All right. Well, you can't respond to all of that, Andrew McKellar, because some of it is well outside your remit, but mm. maybe just on, on one of them intervening in the minimum wage case. Why not? Well, look, uh, I think here that'll be before the Commission. There's a number of uh, different submissions uh, that have been made by uh, interested parties. Uh, as Michelle uh, says, uh, there are a range of uh, uh, you know, different uh, views on uh, what the outcome of that should be. Uh, we are going to be putting in uh, the detail of what we would propose uh, on a wage increase uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, one of the things we're obviously looking at is what's happening on cost of living. Uh, what are the other changes in terms of the social wage? So, for example, the superannuation uh, guarantee uh, going up by another half a percent. You're uh, against that? Uh, no, we're, that's, I mean, that's legislated, so that's uh, something that's happening. But it has to be taken into account. I mean, that's, that's a long-lasting by-product that comes uh, through from the Accord many years ago, and uh, it can't be ignored. I mean, employers yeah. have to pay it. So uh, 
Uh, look, I think you've got to you've got to take into account all of those factors. If I can just say, Greg, I, I do think. Uh, one of the issues here is that the wage price index that we're all looking at doesn't pick up the full story. There is a churn going on in the labour market and mm. when we look at what's happening there, people are changing jobs and they're changing jobs for better remuneration as they go along. So yeah. I think that's something we have to be aware of. Today. All right, Andrew McKellar, Michelle O'Neill, thanks again, both of you, for coming back on Afternoon Briefing. We'll talk again before too long, I'm sure. Great, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Andrew. Well, let's take stock now of week one of this election campaign and the key seats getting the most love so far. Casey Briggs has been tracking the magical mystery tours that are the campaign buses. Tracy, hello there. G'day, Fran. Good to see you. Trace, Casey, where have the leaders been going and what does that tell us about their strategies and their targets? Well, Fran, I think there are some parts of the country at the moment that, uh, you know, if you're not looking where you're going and walking down the street, you may well trip over a member of the travelling media pack or a political uh, candidate because a lot of the visits have been happening in very similar areas from both camps. In fact, uh, the leaders themselves are treading the same ground. If we look in Launceston, uh, today the Prime Minister uh, was in the seat of Bass at least for part of the day meeting the new Tasmanian Premier Jeremy Rockliffe and that meeting happened just metres away from where Anthony Albanese held his press conference on Monday, that one uh, that has proven to be such a defining moment of the first week at least of this campaign where uh, he struggled with those uh, economic and jobs uh, unemployment uh, figures. Uh, and the seat of Bass, you know, has proven to be, uh, you know, a pretty popular spot for police to visit. Also the seat of uh, the, the, the town of Longford uh, in the seat of Lyons, which is held by Labor. In the rest of the country, we've seen both leaders stop through uh, Victoria, particularly Melbourne and Geelong, and the key seat uh, in Geelong of uh, Karayo and Karangamite, which um, are both kind of covering parts of uh, Geelong. And then a lot of time in New South Wales uh, in the key Western Sydney seats of Lindsay, uh, but also the seat of Parramatta. We've even had uh, a visit to the seat of Macquarie from the Prime Minister. You'll see these are Labor seats that the Prime Minister is visiting uh, a fair bit. And then today, of course, um, Anthony Albanese visiting the seat of Hunter alongside his... Um, I think he's. I think uh, Mr. Rapicholi is an abnormally large, tall man, and not uh, Anthony Albanese being a very short man, uh, but quite a, a photo op there in the seat of Hunter. Um, and it's been interesting to see. Um, Labor has, you know, Mr. Albanese spent about half of his time, uh, for half of his media events and pick pick opportunities, uh, visiting seats that Labor hold, and about half visiting seats that the government or other parties. Uh, hold and, and including that key seat of Hunter, which you know might not look like one that you'd be particularly worried about, but it is the seat that One Nation performed most strongly in three years ago. So that's maybe the threat that they're worried about there. Whereas the government, Scott Morrison, has actually visited more, uh, had more um, events in Labor-held seats okay. uh, than his own seats, which is really interesting. Uh, you know, that's not normally the pattern in an election campaign. The government is normally defending its own seats, but of course it sort of underlines that they're hoping to pick up some seats to, to hold on to government here as well. Oh, it's mind games, Casey. Casey, I'm actually interested in another data set you've been collecting this week. You've had your stopwatch out on the leaders' press conferences. Why do we care? Yeah, Fran, they kind of became part of the story this week with, uh, uh, you know, early in the we earlier in the week, um, it, you know, really noticeable difference in how long these press conferences were going for. The Prime Minister really staying on message, taking a few questions and getting out. This was the press conference that kicked the whole campaign off and it only ran for about 12 minutes from uh, the PM, whereas Anthony Albanese stood and took questions for more than half an hour. But what that meant is a lot of time for journalists to ask questions uh, and they coordinated and really um, prosecuted uh, and interrogated him on those economic figures on Monday. And as that became a problem we saw uh, yesterday, Albanese adopted a similar strategy to what the Prime Minister uh, had adopted, just a nine-minute press conference, uh, really trying to stick to his key message and get out of there uh, because it, you know, seemed to be working pretty well. Uh, it's not something we as journalists like to see short press conferences, but as a political strategy, um, it does work pretty well. And you've seen the Prime Minister with, you know, less heat on him, with less kind of coordinated, uh, you know, one big issue. He's been getting lots of different questions on lots of different topics and so sure. uh, hasn't had that sort of uh, single issue he's been interrogated on. His press conferences has been getting longer through the week and, you know, nearly three quarters of an hour today. Well, you know what they say, Casey, follow the numbers. Thanks very much, Casey.
Well, the leaders' campaign is slowing down over Easter, but the first few days have had plenty of drama. And to take a look at this campaign so far, I'm joined now by two veterans of election campaigns, Graham Morris, long-time Liberal campaigner, former Chief of Staff to John Howard, and nowadays Chair of lobbying firm Barton Deacon, and Ryan Liddell, partner of Principal Advisory, and Bill Shorten's former Chief of Staff. Ryan, Graham, thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, Graham, before we get to the points Casey was making there, just that uh, horrible car accident with the PM security detail, four people in hospital, though not life-threatening injuries, thank God. The Prime Minister suspended campaigning for the afternoon. How, do an ev how does an event like this, does an event like this, you know, change the atmospherics of a campaign? It, it, it gives you a terrible fright. Um, the travelling team, because it could well have been the Prime Minister's car. And, you know, not, not to downgrade the, the importance of the security people, but, you know, they drive not like you and I. You know, there's got to be no, no car allowed behind the Prime Minister's car, so they're zooming in and out. But I wonder what it is about Tasmania and Prime Ministers and travel. I, I was in a plane with, the Prime, with Prime Minister Howard once. We got hit by lightning going to Tasmania, made a hell of a bang, and when we got when we landed, there was this huge dent in the door and a massive burn mark. And again, Prime Ministerial travel. Yeah, Prime Ministerial travel. And this case certainly, uh, you know, it could have been really, really serious. That car rolled over. The car looked you know, in terrible state, but thankfully the four police officers uh, inside uh, seem to be, well, certainly police say not life-threatening. Um, Ryan, just heading back to the campaign now that we're on, uh, Casey's press conference data we saw there. Is it fair to read anything into this, Ryan, because much is being attributed to Anthony Albanese's sudden move from open-ended questioning at press conferences to in and out? Oh, look, Fran, you only get 30 seconds on the TV news every night, no matter how long or short your press conference is, so... Yeah, but they were very long for those first few days. Yeah, no, 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 I appreciate that. Look, at the end of the day, you know, the press conference is there. It's designed to get your message out. Um, it's designed to be accountable. You know, it's not designed to be there to be entertainment for the travelling sort of press pack, so get your message out and then move on. Yeah, but you're not trying to tell me that there wasn't a change of strategy here, that this wasn't in response to that first very loose, well, second, actually, but the Monday press conference of Anthony Albanese where he made that terrible gaffe about unemployment. Oh, sure. Look, the, you know, the press conference yesterday from, from Albo is much shorter and I think that's a good thing uh, because at the end of the day, as I said, you know, it doesn't really matter how long or short the press conference is. You've got 30 seconds on the TV news that night. Um, and you get, get your message out and then move out. Uh, Graham, you are, I've used this word before, but it certainly suits you, a veteran of Liberal campaigns. How are you seeing this one so far? N I'm not so much talking about their key messages. We, we talk a lot about that. But the choice of announcements so far, the demeanour of the different leaders and who they're surrounding themselves with at each doorstop, for instance. Yeah, well... <laughs> The Prime Minister surrounding himself with marginal candidates. Well, he's and, doing a bit more than that. He's making a lot of point about his team, and I'm wondering if that's in response to the fact that the polls are showing us very clearly that he himself is not so popular, so he's trying to sort of diffuse that. No, it's a fact of life. The team is Come really on. important. And it's and it's yeah, it's comparative. You know, we have the Prime Minister's main message is, is easy. You know, a safe, secure country, um, lots of jobs, good economy, and don't hand the country over to a goose. It's not, it's not that hard. But on the other side, and he's got a team to prove it, Mr Albanese has decided to run, run a campaign which is a one-person campaign. And given that he cocked up the first week, that is really dangerous. And I suspect not only will we have the change on press conferences, but I suspect when we come back from Easter, he will be propped up by somebody like Tanya Plebersek. They can't keep going the way they are. Uh, Ryan, do you think we'll see that change? And is it so that Anthony Albanese... I mean, normally, the last few campaigns, they've been very presidential, these campaigns, based around the leaders, given what the sort of, uh, at least, qu uh, qualitative polling is uh, suggesting about Anthony Albanese. He needs to put a bit more known entity around him and maybe a bit more colour and movement. Oh, look, you know, obviously it's been a bit of a tough start for, for the Labor Party, but, like, let's have some perspective here. We're not even a quarter time yet, you know, in this campaign. You know, and if people, like, the Liberal Party think that, you know, uh, people are going to forget the last three years of, of uh, Scott Morrison as Prime Minister in three days, like, they're kidding themselves. Like, uh, Albo's had people like Katie Gallagher on the, on, the, on the campaign trail. He's got some excellent people on his front bench. Jim Chalmers, Penny Wong, uh, Tanya Plibersek. Uh, like, that'd obviously be an asset in the campaign trail. 
OK. The Prime Minister got a free ride for a couple of days off the back of that Albanese howler over the unemployment rate. Um, but Scott Morrison's coming under a bit of pressure now on the issue of, issue of broken promises, which feeds directly into the Labor criticism they've been trying to build. This morning, the travelling press pack pressed Scott Morrison on his announcement yesterday that he had no plans to introduce a National Integrity Commission in the next term of government. This is how they went today. Let's have a look. Talking about a National Integrity Commission, you are asking Australians to trust you mm. and you haven't delivered on a promise mm. about trust, about integrity. So well, how can Australians I, I trust you when you it's because... a broken promise, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. But you promised you would establish one in the last term. You have not. That's a broken promise. We put forward our proposal in detailed legislation and it has not been supported by the Labor Party. I need bipartisan support Why to put that in place. I'm not going to introduce a, a, a kangaroo court. I put forward a detailed plan, a detailed proposal, which the Labor Party rejects. So I've honoured my proposal. The Labor Party don't support it. That's where the issue rests. Graham, is the Prime Minister in a bit of trouble here? No matter how he cuts it, he did promise to introduce it before the next ele this election, and he hasn't. And he tried. Well, what's he hasn't. He didn't introduce it into the parliament, and you know well, that. What's, what's the point of introducing something that you know is going to get killed? It's just silly. And, and he's well, come up with a plan... Aren't we in a plan. contest of ideas here? Isn't that what the parliament does? It amends yeah. bills, it strengthens things, it changes things. So why doesn't, why doesn't the Labor Party agree with it? <laughs> now, the point is... <clears throat> no, I'm serious. If they're so keen on it, why not agree with it? It could have got through. It could have been up by now. But there's no way the government this government is ever going to agree to what those morons in ICAC in New South Wales have got, where you can just destroy people's careers and livelihood and lives and find, oh, sorry, we were wrong, and they don't even apologise. OK, that but is, we're not discussing is... the New South Wales ICAC version yeah, here. We are. We're discussing the issue that... of whether the Prime Minister made a promise and hasn't fulfilled that promise. He came up with a proper proposition that is not the New South Wales ICAC, it's a Canberra one that will work and the Labor Party wouldn't, wouldn't wear it. So why put it up knowing the Senate's going to kill it? That's okay. stupid. Ryan Liddell, I'm going to be talking about the model with Helen Haynes, so I don't really want to go there with you, but is Scott Morrison vulnerable on the issue of broken promises? Is that what Labor's banking on? And if so, why haven't we seen that kind of negative campaign from them yet? Well, I think uh, Mr. Morrison, in the same way that someone that you know that Graham Morris used to work for, is a very uh, is a very clever politician. I'll just make two points. Firstly, one, you know, this is a this was an ironclad promise that Mr. Morrison took to the last election, 2019, and then he spent the last three years sort of walking back from that promise. Now, this is that's a perfect personification of what people uh, are, are feeling about. Scott Morrison, what um, you know, a, a punt is a sort of saying. There's a real, there's a, there's a trust and there's a confidence sort of issue there. But the second point I'll make is that there are Liberal MPs such as Dave Sharma, uh, Josh Frydenberg, uh, uh, Tim Wilson, uh, who will be absolutely furious at the Prime Minister here. The fact that he's uh, openly admitting that he's, you know, he, he's, he's effectively mothballing an effective ICAC. Uh, these Liberal MPs are on the back foot in their candidate in, in their electorates. Uh, and he's just shining a spotlight on these very issues that their independent um, opponents uh, are, you know, are, are hitting them over, hitting them over the head with. So I think uh, they would be furious at him uh, for drawing attention to this. Graham Morris, what is the Prime Minister's tactic here? Because um, exactly what Ryan Riddell said there, we spoke to one of the independents, uh, Allegra Spender, who's taking on Dave Sharma in Wentworth. She said if she was negotiating in a hung parliament, a National Integrity Commission with teeth would be absolutely part of the bargaining. Um, but also the Prime Minister this week uh, really went on the front foot over this issue of um, uh, trans people in women's sport. He said he'd have more to say about it. He backed in his captain's pick camp candidate in the seat of Warringah, a woman by the name of Catherine Devis. Then it was revealed she'd made some pretty um, offensive t uh, text tweets about this whole issue. And the Prime Minister has had to backtrack. He said he now has no plans to introduce legislation on this. Again, this is an issue that would not... You wouldn't want to put that up in lights in the seat like uh, North Sydney for Trent Zimmerman or Wentworth with Dave Sharma or Higgins for, for Katie Allen. Does the Prime Minister not? not want to help these people get elected? What's he doing here? Why not? Why not? Why wouldn't you put it up? Well, it wouldn't every, play well every, in those seats, is what I'm every, saying. Every, every mum and dad in the, in the country knows that what Catherine Deves was trying to do is right. And that is, you know, you can't have blinking 
Chinese women who used to be blokes up against our swimming team in the Olympics. You can't have Russian women who used to be blokes up against our Matildas. And in your case, Fran, you can't have uh, feeder Aussie rules teams feeding the Sydney Swans and, and the Giants um, with, with blokes. No, there's, uh, there's, issues, women, around, there's issues around law reform, the laws we already have, there's issues around human rights and there's issues around tone. My question to you is, no, do you think Trent Zimmerman and Dave Sharma would welcome these positions being so publicly flagged by the Prime Minister? It won't be helping their campaigns, will it? So what is the broader, the broader strategy here from the Prime Minister? Money gets asked questions on these sideline issues, so he has to answer them. That's not his basic message. But, you know, fair income, do we really want... Mums and dads out there worried about whether or not big, beefy people are playing against their 16-year-old girls in sport. There's something wrong with that. And I think, I think Catherine Deves, if she was anything but a Liberal candidate, all the women around the country would be cheering her on because she's trying to save women's sport at a time when we're all getting really interested in it. Orion Liddell, I'm not sure what you think about that, but also do you think there is a broader strategy here from the Prime Minister and going on the front foot of these issues? Is uh, it about authenticity? What, who's he signalling to here? Putting aside the stupidity of what Graeme just said, um, I think the real issue here is, like, there's a, like, the Prime Minister is drawn to wedge issues like moth to a flame. As sure as night follows day, there's a wedge issue, he'll grab onto it and run with it as hard as he can. This one got too hot and he realised that his candidate said some stupid things, so he had to backtrack. But you can just see that instinct. As soon as, it's, as, soon as there's an opportunity to grab onto it, he grabs onto it. OK, a minute each here, finally, for this final question. Uh, Graham. Even John Howard, you've worked a long time closely with John Howard. Even John Howard said, so what, when he was asked about the Albanese grab, a gaffe on unemployment. Do you agree with him or do you think Labor's gone backwards I, I, irreversibly in this election? I talked to him yesterday about that and he said, when he, when he got asked the question, he sort of didn't know what it was about. And when he realised how big the mistake was, um, he expressed his view that the, prime, the opposition leader should have known that figure. But, yeah, he... Uh, he, he realises they gave the wrong answer to a question he, he, he didn't know the background. No, but I'm understanding that everyone understands Anthony Albanese should have known that figure, but how big, a, how big a negative is this for Anthony Albanese in this campaign? From, from all the campaigns you've, you've been a part of, oh, look, can he get out from look, under this? Look, there are, there are a lot worse mistakes in campaigns there have been, but never, ever at the start of a campaign. And, and, you know, in a period where even, even undecided voters in this morning's paper were saying that Mr Albanese sort of a gap filler, presumably between Ryan's old boss and Tanya Plibersek, yet a mistake like this just cuts through and you just cannot... Afford, can, he, can he come back? Well, of course he can. But the government picked up a point um, with the budget. They picked up a point when the election was called. I presume on Monday when the polls come up, there might be another point because of Mr Albanese. That okay. makes this election very close. Ryan Liddell, do you presume that too? And what's Labor's plan to try and pull ahead in the next five weeks? <laughs> well, to be fair to Graham, you know, I've sat in focus groups that have said things about Scott Morrison that aren't is suitable for daytime television. So, you know, focus groups are focus groups. But to the broader point, you know, um, as I said before, if people think, if the Liberals think that, you know, um, uh, the last three days are going to erase the three, the three last three years of Scott Morrison's um, government, uh, then they're absolutely kidding themselves. And I think what you'll find is over the sort of coming weeks, as uh, Mr Morrison sort of goes around the country, you know, people start to see, hang on a second, um, a vote for the Liberals, the vote for the Liberals is a vote for Scott Morrison for three more years. Morrison for three more years, that's a very powerful message from the Labor Party. Oh. Um, and once that starts to resonate, I think there should be some fairly strong cut through. Ryan Liddell, Graham Morris, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Well, 80% of all Australians think corruption is a problem. That's according to ABC's Vote Compass survey of voter attitudes released today. Another survey released today by the Australia Institute has 75% of Australians supporting the establishment of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. As we were discussing earlier, Prime Minister Scott Morrison was forced to defend today a broken promise to establish a Federal Integrity Commission during this term of government. Joining me now is the independent member for Indi, Helen Haynes, who tried to have her own Federal 
Federal Integrity Bill debated by the Parliament. Helen Haynes, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Thanks very much, Fran, and hello to all your viewers this afternoon. Helen, those survey re results I referred to, do they concur with the views of people in your electorate and people you've been in contact with? 100%, Fran. In fact, I'm surprised it's not higher. Everywhere I go, whether it's I'm um, speaking to a footy club, a probus club, people on the street, uh, at a community organisation, the number one thing they talk about is integrity in politics, their failing trust in government, and the fact that they're sick to death of being pork barrelled during an election campaign. So I'm not surprised one bit. Do you think it's a vote changer? I mean, I know a lot of the independents who are up against smaller liberals and some of those uh, leafy Melbourne and Sydney seats, they're putting it top of their agenda. But is it a vote changer? I believe it is, Fran. The people of Indi tell me it is, and uh, everyone who contacts me from around the nation seems to think so too. This speaks to fundamental Australian values about trust. Uh, no one wants to get ripped off, and right now people feel like they're being ripped off by their federal government. Every state and territory, as you know, have some form of anti-corruption body. Uh, we had a prime minister who made a promise, a fundamental promise, on integrity and uh, chooses to break that promise of all promises. Uh, we've got a prime minister who's trying to be really slippery about this. Uh, I know for sure that uh, should I walk back into the parliament after this election and introduce a Federal Integrity Commission bill, my bill, the Australian Federal Integrity Commission bill, I would have multi-partisan support, including uh, a member of the government and quite possibly more members of the government. So it's Mr Morrison who doesn't seem to understand the importance of this. Do you think that's why the Prime Minister's made it clear he's not going to try again to introduce a National Integrity Bill because he doesn't want to face a number of his own MPs walking across the floor to vote against it? I think that's very obvious, Fran, and I think it was very obvious today listening to the Prime Minister in Tasmania. Uh, we know that the member for Bass is a, a person of high integrity and someone who felt that this was so important that she supported my bill in the Parliament to be debated in November. Um, I think the Prime Minister will do anything he can not to talk about uh, my legislation, the one piece of legislation that has had multi-partisan support in the House of Representatives. Well, the, the Prime Minister says he's introduced a bill, but he didn't get bipartisan support, so you know, he won't go again with it. Um, let's not quibble. He didn't. The government didn't formally introduce their bill. But what's wrong with the government's bill? And how? What's lacking from their bill? The prime minister says some of the others being put forward are modelled on the New South Wales ICAC, which he calls a kangaroo court. So, Fran, that point uh, that the government uh, introduced a bill and that Mr Morrison likes to say that he tabled a bill is, again, not true. Uh, a, an exposure draft never introduced to the House, no opportunity to debate it, certainly no opportunity to vote on it. And that's a really important point. So I don't take... Uh, I don't say things like being slippery lightly. Uh, that is being slippery. It's never been introduced to the Parliament. Uh, again, a red herring to keep uh, talking about New South Wales ICAC. I've got legislation before the House that has been lauded by legal experts across the nation as being strong, robust, but having the necessary safeguards in it to make sure that it's fit for purpose. The government's bill fails on multiple accounts. Uh, the government claim that it has all of the powers of a royal commission, yet it won't allow public hearings for members of parliament or departmental staff. A royal commission can always have a public hearing. It has two sets of rules, in fact. Public hearings could be available or would be available for law enforcement agencies, but not for MPs. Government bill would not take referrals from the public. Uh, the government bill would not have public reports of findings, no findings. That's completely different to a Royal Commission. So make no mistake, when the Prime Minister talks about his fit for purpose bill, it's completely untrue. It is not like a Royal Commission and he's trying to dupe the Australian people. I won't have it. I will fight for this. Uh, for as long as I'm in Parliament, I will fight for the truth on this one. If we end up in hung Parliament territory on election night, would the establishment of your model of a Federal Integrity Commission be a, critic, be a deal breaker for you? Absolute deal breaker, Fran. Again, that's no surprise to the nation and it would be no surprise to the people I represent. I've been fighting for a robust federal integrity. We can restore trust in our federal parliament and so that we can get a fair deal when it comes to the spending of public funds. My electorate know how strong I am on this. They know that because they tell me to do this. Uh, they're sick to death of being ripped off. They're sick to death of the waste. They're sick to death of ministers getting away with this. The only way to fix this rotting problem 
is to have a robust Federal Integrity Commission. We need to get on and do it. OK, and just finally on another matter, the government's uh, half, a bil half a million dollar payout to Rochelle Miller, uh, Alan Tudge's former staff member who had an intimate relationship with the Minister. Ms Miller, through her lawyers this afternoon, has released the Commonwealth of any obligation of confidentiality relating to that claim. Uh, Simon Birmingham earlier said, well, he doesn't know the details, so he can't relate, release them. Does the Prime Minister owe the public any kind of explanation about this settlement? Should it be made transparent, the details of this settlement, if Alan Tudge is going to be readmitted to the Cabinet? Well, Fran, um, let's go to the words of the Jenkins Review. And uh, one of the findings of the Jenkins Review, one of the recommendations, was to get rid of these non-disclosure clauses. Of course the Prime Minister needs to come clean on this. Ms Miller has given now full permission for this to take place. $500,000 of taxpayer money, and the Prime Minister is trying to hide hide this from the taxpayer. Uh, outrageous. We have a right to know. Ms Miller has given permission. Of course, um, this needs to be made completely transparent. Again, it speaks to integrity. Where is the integrity from this government? And where okay. is there a transparent code of conduct as well? Helen Haynes, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Sharon. Well, Fran, you wouldn't exactly know that the campaigns might be slowing down ahead of the Easter break based on the cracking pace with which you've been rattling through the issues there this afternoon. Well done. Uh, just to pick up on a couple of points, I suppose, uh, on your discussion with Helen Haynes, there are certainly some hardheads in coalition circles who say in the event of a hung parliament, a National Integrity Commission would be an easy giveaway when it comes to a bargaining chip. Like, they might say no and never this side of an election, but if that was one you had to throw on the table to form a government afterwards, they'd be prepared to do just that. It's just interesting that they're not giving an inch on it this side of the election, though. Yeah, well, there you go. That's why I'm not a government strategist, so I hadn't thought of that. Um, so they might be setting up like they a They might be a cynics. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So certainly we know that climate and we know that issues of integrity are matters for those who could end up being negotiators in a hung parliament. Helen Haynes is one. Should Allegra Sender spend a beat Dave Sharma in Wentworth? I've no idea if she would, but if she did, she said those would be the issues for her. And th th that's really replicated. Um, so yes, is the government setting it up, leaving it there on the table as an easy bargaining chip? Well, maybe you're right, Greg, but um, the Prime Minister, you know, certainly has backtracked on this. It certainly does open Labor's attack over broken promises. This Prime Minister doesn't keep his word. Uh, Helen Haynes will hear from others, I'm sure, is making the same jibe against the Prime Minister. So yeah. he is paying a price in the short term in this campaign, but as you say, maybe they've got their eye longer term. Well, this campaign has already speared off in directions we hadn't exactly foreseen. That was only week one, Fran. You get yourself a good break over Easter, uh, four blessed days off, and come back nice and fresh, and we'll take the wild journey into whatever week two brings us. Have a nice Thanks, time. Greg. Happy Easter, everybody. Have a great break. Yeah, good one, Fran. Now, look, just before uh, we leave you for the day, we might just uh, update you on a statement that's come through Scott Morrison's Facebook page relating to the vehicle accident in Tasmania. It says, earlier this afternoon, two of my protective detail, along with two Tasmanian police officers, were involved in a terrible car accident. I'm relieved they've all been safely transferred to hospital. I'm incredibly grateful to all the police who look after me and my family and I hope to hear further good news about their condition. Jen and I, that's his wife, also send our thanks, love and best wishes to them and their families. So that's the last word from the Prime Minister and the last word from us ahead of the Easter weekend. Have a terrific break. Fran and I will be back with you, barring unforeseen events, on Tuesday. Tuesday.